Whew. All right. Um, thanks guys for hanging in there. I'm trying to, um, to definitely um, be as thorough as I can, but I know just how long this can take if, if I don't move quickly. Um, the perfect settings. Um, this is, this is um, a part where we're gonna kind of throw all this stuff together. Um, and so um, when it comes to finding the perfect settings, I just wanna let you guys know that it, one size does not fit all. Um, what works good for one person isn't gonna work for someone else, even if they have the same machine with the same laser tube in it. You know, these laser tubes are still made by hand. They're all glass blown, all right? And so they got gas put in them and, you know, they test all of them and they all get a relatively close number of wattage coming out of them, but it's not exact. And then you got so many other variables. I mean, your material is a huge variable. You know, the, the Baltic birch you get from your Home Depot is different than one I get. And sometimes they use different glues in them. Um, you know, you know, even, even your climate, I mean, if, for me, it's much easier to heat up material down here in Florida because it's already 80 degrees. But if you're somewhere where it's cold, you got to start by, you know, getting your material to not be cold before you can get it to evaporate. Um, so, you know, I see that a lot. People are like, hey, what are good settings for this? Um, it really is difficult um, to share settings with somebody, uh, but it gets you in the ballpark and that's fine. Uh, but we like to teach everyone here how to fish. Um, and that, that really is that really is helpful. Um, and so it is tempting to go asking for settings, but you know, we're gonna teach you how to use the scientific method um, to find it. Um, and, and, and it's gonna make you a much more you know, confident user. You'll be able to find settings for anything. Um, and, and that way you're not digging around trying to find settings every time you try something new, you'll have a, an approach you can take. So, yep, back to science class. Um, I know I didn't do very well in this class, but but this part stuck with me and I've used it a lot. Um, I've, I've troubleshot a lot in my life and, and the scientific method really is a matter of, of starting with a hypothesis. So you've got to at least have an idea of, of what you're trying to test. Uh, and then you have to try to test it and see what works. Um, and then you repeat tests until you, you know, you can get results and, and, and draw a conclusion from there. But the key, the key there is really to only change one variable at a time. So if you're trying some settings out and they don't work, try changing the speed, try changing the power, try changing you know, the interval, play with that stuff, but play with it individually. The minute you start changing stuff all at the same time, yeah, you might get it to work, you might get lucky, but you really didn't learn anything. Um, and and that's, that success is short-lived. Um, so. You know, the sooner that you can start drawing your own hypothesis and making your own conclusions, uh, the sooner you can achieve boss mode with your laser. Uh, and that's just the truth right there. Um, keeping a journal is really important. Um, Lightburn does have a library that you can use to, um, you know, basically record settings. So that's helpful. Uh, but if you're like me and you don't trust your computer all that much to save all that for you, write it down. You know, you can get a little notepad or, or just a little log and I put everything in there. I mean, I talk in, I, I put the skews of the material I'm using, you know, how thick it is, what lens I got in the machine, what focus I have in there too. I mean, that's a big thing. Sometimes again, you take things out of focus purposely. So you wanna make sure you record that so you can repeat it again later. Speed interval focus, you know, you wanna put your spiff in there. Um, and a file name, it always helps. You, if you store a file in Lightburn, and I see a lot of people make this mistake, they're not saving their Lightburn files. You know, if you spend 30 minutes trying to find the perfect settings to, to engrave a Tumblr, save it um, and save it for that specific Tumblr. Call it Arctic Blue. Um, and that's your Arctic Blue Tumblr. Uh, yes, the color is important. Some colors are going to require different settings than other colors. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty thorough. So write it down. Um, and, you know, here we are talking about your results. So, you know, there really is only four possible results. And, and to be honest, um, they are all just, um, you know, simple variations of burns, just different depths that you can achieve. Um, so uh, there are a few exceptions, but, but this is the main one. Ablating is, is really just removing the surface layer uh, or a coating. So, um, that is pretty much just taking that top layer off of the material and nothing more. 
Um, and then cutting is the complete opposite. You're gonna sever a piece of material completely in half in the two pieces. So two extremes right there. Um, and then engraving and scoring, they're kind of you know in the same boat. Engraving, you're you're creating a cavity. You're you're removing material, making a recessed cavity in the in in the uh, you know beyond the surface. And the depth on that is is totally up to you. Um, and then scoring is is really just um, you know something similar. It usually pertains to to actually tracing out a line or a shape. Um, so. It's, um, you know, it's, it's usually a term reserved for vector or for cutting where you're just scoring material. Um, but a lot of times it implies that you're going to bend it, um, which you can do. It's super cool if you've ever seen people bending wood because they're scoring their laser, uh, their wood a certain way, and then they can bend it. Um, that's how that's done. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, if you're just trying to engrave a line instead of cut it, then that's also known as scoring. And the depth really doesn't matter in that case. Um, but that's, that's really all you can control here is you can control really how deep the laser goes and that's about it. Um, so these are, you know, your, your different types of results. Um, and here's the good stuff. Here's where we're getting to the good stuff, speed and power. So the combination of these settings are interconnected. We've talked about it already and they will determine um, how deep you get into the material. Um, so, you know, here's how they're interconnected. If you wanna increase heat, you can turn up the power or you could slow down the speed. We talked about that. The slower you go, the more time it has to heat up, uh, vice versa. Uh, if you wanna reduce the heat, you can either turn down the power or you can increase the speed. Both achieve the same result. So that connection, you guys, uh, when you make it, it'll, it'll really help you start playing around with settings. So um, here's some tips. If you're gonna score um, or cut, um, and I'm, I'm using scoring here as if you wanted to bend the material, so basically, you're, you're very close to cutting through, but you're not. Um, I, I recommend you start with mid to high power and adjust only the speed until you get the desired depth or you cut all the way through. So this is, this is, this is the approach here. Um, you know, and, and if you've got you know, a 90 watt or 100 watt laser, use it. I mean, it's just, you, you can't hurt it. I know there's a lot of information out there that says, you know, don't laser at 100% power. Um, that's for people that bought lasers that aren't, um, dialed in properly and, and you know, the laser is, is not set up to, to limit you from, from causing harm to the laser tube. We take care of that for you. So even at 100% power, it, you're, you're not going to go beyond the manufacturer's recommended amperage for that laser tube. Um, I will tell you this though, between 80 and 100%, there really isn't a big difference. Um, so if something's not cutting at 80, it's probably not going to cut at 100 most of the power in these laser tubes is at the bottom end when you're in like the 30 to 50% range. Um, I tell people think about it as, as like a muscle car. It has a lot of torque, you know, when you first step on the gas, um, but then at the, at the high end, it's really unimpressive. Um, and so that's how, the, how these laser tubes are. So yeah, cutting, I'd say set it to 80, 90%, use all that power and then adjust your speed. Um, 20 millimeters a second is probably you know, in the ballpark, I've seen some people cutting at 30. Uh, if it's really thick material, you might have to drop it down to 10 or even five, you know, get a crawl. But that's the ballpark there for cutting anything. Uh, and if you're scoring, uh, you could be a little less conservative depending on how thick that material is um, or if you're trying to cut something really thin. So you can lower the power to maybe that 30 to 50 range um, and try going a little faster but I seldom see in any application that you can really go beyond 50 millimeters a second. So that's just something to keep in mind. You're gonna be somewhere in that, in that range, 50 millimeters uh, and below for the speed. And when you're engraving and ablating, um, I, I suggest the opposite approach. So start with a relatively quick speed and then adjust the power until the depth you desire is reached. Um, so it's the opposite approach. So here you start with a speed of, let's say 300 millimeters a second. That's usually a pretty great place to start. That's my go-to. Um, you know, if you have a large area uh, to cover or you're doing a lot of items at once, that's when it might help to, you know, go faster than that. But typically if you're engraving, you know, a coaster or a Yeti cup or, or you know, one-off piece, um, just one at a time, 300 is, is really in the ballpark. And so, um, you know, you want to adjust your power um, to, to, to affect your depth. Um, and if, it, if you're still not getting the depth you want, then you can start lowering that speed. So that's how you do that. The power stays the same the whole time. 
and you're just playing, you know, you're just um, uh, adjusting the, the speed there. Um, so th that's, that's really a, a, good, um, a, a good rule of thumb. Um, so, you know, just to recap, when you're scoring or cutting, set the power high and play around with the speed. Uh, when you're engraving or ablating, set the speed to a mid range there, about 300 or 400, and then, and then play with the power. Um, and if at the end of the day, you want to go deeper, well, then you just have to really slow it down. Um, there are situations where, you know, you want to use faster speed. And I mentioned that uh, that's when you're doing a raise of you know, multiple items um, scattered across your table or a, or big, a really big item. Uh, and that's really where you can use um, more speed. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't engrave faster or, or the machine won't work faster if you're using high speeds on a small item. And the reason for that is something we call overscanning. Um, so, you know, just think about a car here. Um, if, you, if you're going to travel, uh, um, a car has to travel a certain distance before you can hit your top speed in it. Um, and, and so the laser, it works the same way. It's trying to achieve this, this um, you know, this power setting, um, but it wants to hit the speed that you set in there first. So it's going to back up. It's going to create enough room for it to launch uh, and hit that top speed before it hits your, your design. So the faster you go, the more space it needs to basically, um, you know, speed up and slow down. So then it can change directions and speed up and go the opposite direction. So, you know, it, if you set the speed higher, the laser does have to travel more distance. Uh, and we're talking about scanning here. We're talking about that left to right um, uh, motion. So just keep that in mind. You're doing small items again. Stay to 300 or or 400 millimeters a second. Um, if you're you know if you're doing a really large item, you could probably do you know 600, 700, 800. You know, get to the top speed of the machine where it's really sweeping across the whole bed, um, and that's really the only time that those high speeds are really uh, are really effective at all. Um, lines per inch. That is that's a really good one. Um, so. This is this is tied into your interval again, uh, and again, I, I I stress this enough. You you're always going to really start focusing on speed and power, um, but when you are doing a fill, um, you can adjust the the interval, and that's the the paint analogy I, I mentioned earlier. So um, in light burn, it's known as interval. It's also known as LPI lines per inch. I find lines per inch to be easier because of the way it breaks down number wise. So we're dealing with you know, a couple whole numbers here. Um, so, you know, this is, a, this is gonna affect your resolution, how tight those lines are to each other. Um, so again, the lawnmower analogy and all that stuff is coming up, but um, you're doing 300 LPI, that gets you a pretty decent amount of detail. I sometimes have found stuff where you wanna go higher. Maybe you're doing a photograph and you really wanna squeeze in those dots to get the resolution. So that's when an LPI of maybe 400 will come in handy. Um, however, if you have a real heat sensitive material, something that tends to melt, you know, or, or like glass, for example, where you really want to just fracture it and not, not really melt it, um, then I reduce that LPI to maybe 200. That creates more space between the lines. Of course, your resolution gets lower too as you do that, um, but it's very minute. And the important thing here is we're, we're trying to control heat, right? We're still in that mode of like, okay, we've got an item in our machine now that, that we want to engrave and we don't want it to get too hot. Um, and that's kind of, you know, how you can affect that. Um, and that brings us to a couple other techniques um, with focus. Uh, this stuff you could start playing around with now, but it, you, know, you could really have fun with the laser without getting this deep into it. So if you don't really understand it now, don't, don't feel overwhelmed by it, but uh, feathering is, is what I call when you purposely take the laser out of focus. So it's just another way um, to spread that heat out, to disperse the heat so it's not so concentrated into such a tiny spot. So if you purposely lower your, your material away from um, the focal point, so you bring the machine into focus and then you manually drop the table one or two millimeters, That'll make the that'll disperse the the, uh, the the laser beam again. So it'll come into focus and then it'll start to kind of spread out, and you'll be engraving with that spread out area. Um, so all the heat won't be so concentrated. 
uh, did an example of this on a baseball bat once. It came out really cool. I took the laser beam way out of focus. It was a really big logo um, and it gave it a surface burn. It looked like it had just been burned on the surface. It didn't remove any material. It just charred it. Um, and it was a really, really cool effect. It looked like it was branded, not, not lasered. So that's just ways you can play with your spot size. Uh, but again, we're trying to just think of ways of controlling the heat. And I want you guys to know that you know, playing with your focus can do that. And vice versa, if you're trying to cut really thick material, um, sometimes you want to put that, that really intense focal spot, you want to put it into the material, not on the surface. Um, so when you press autofocus on your machine and you bring it into focus, it's putting the most powerful point of the laser onto the surface of the material. Um, and, and when you're cutting, that's not where you really want the most powerful spot. It will work, if, especially if you're doing thin stuff. Um, but if you're getting into like, you know, three eighths or half inch material, I recommend that you raise the bed up um, so that that focal point ends up in the core of the material, like right in the dead middle of it. That way you get your most powerful point of the laser beam inside of it um, and the strongest parts of, of the beam leading up to that focal point and, and leading out of it uh, are, are, you know, covering the rest of, of your material. Um, so that's, um, that's a little trick there. Again, it's just, it's just stuff I'm sharing with you guys because it's important to realize that you know, these are the ways you can control um, your, your, your burn. Um, it's, it's through those things, speed, power, interval, and focus. So that's, that's everything that you can really do with the laser. The rest now is really just in light burn um, and on the controller. Uh, and there's a few other little things we're gonna go through. Um, but we've covered the entire machine, how it works, um, what it actually does, and it just removes materials and, and, and how controlling each one of these settings really affects it. So, you know, if you, once you adopt that mindset, I mean, you can get in here and start playing with stuff. And that's when you really can start doing this scientific method I talked about, where you can be like, yeah, this material is melting. Let's try to, you know, let's do what Danny said and try to dissipate that heat a little bit. Um, you know, play with the lines per inch, no, don't make it so tight, or let's purposely take it out of focus and feather it and see how that comes out. Uh, try that on tumblers. I, I've, I got a lot of people that purposely take their laser out of focus to do tumblers when they're trying to remove that coating because it just, it gets really sticky and you got to sit there and scrub each tumbler with a magic eraser. Uh, if you play around with the settings, you want to do that.